In this example, we're going to construct a relative frequency histogram for the 34 ages of patients who suffered stress strokes. So we're going to use this table of data, this frequency table here, to create a relative frequency histogram. Try to remember what a relative frequency histogram is. It's basically like a bar chart. And we're going to create a bar on our chart for each of these given categories, right? So each of these categories is going to have a bar. So there are eight categories. There'll be eight bars in our drawing. And you'll notice that these categories are all equal width. In other words, the distance from 25 to 30 is 5. And you see from 30 to 35, it's 5. And you'll see throughout the list here, the width is always a constant value of 5. That's going to be important for us because it's going to mean we can do this uh, histogram by allowing the percents to be the heights of the rectangle, while the width of the rectangle is going to be reflected in the fact that this is Five. Okay, so that'll make our drawing look the way it should look, and we'll be okay with that. In the case where the width is not uniform, in other words, it's not the same distance from lower limit to lower limit throughout the table, whenever that happens, we're going to have to use a slightly different approach. But for this example, we'll use this approach where the percents are going to represent the heights of the rectangle, and the width will be given by the class width. So the only thing we have to do um, before we start doing the drawing is to create boundaries, class boundaries instead of these class limits. The boundaries are necessary anytime you have limits that have spaces between them. So see we go from 25 to 29 and the next category starts at 30. That's not okay for our histogram. We don't want to have a gap like that between the bars. So we need to have this category extend all the way up until it touches this category. We're going to do that by creating class boundaries instead of these given class limits. The class boundaries are essentially, as we've discussed before, the numbers that are right between each of these categories that are in the middle. We're going to be able to figure out all the boundaries for this table, and then from there we'll take the boundaries and the percentages, and we'll go ahead and create our drawing. So let's start, first of all, by doing the boundaries. So if you recall in the past, we said that we take the difference between this number and this number, and then we divide that difference in half. So what's the difference between 29 and 30? Well, the answer is 1. And if we divide 1 and half, we get 0 0.5. 0 0.5 becomes the thing we use to generate all the boundaries. The way we do it is we subtract it from this number, right, or this column, and we add it to this column. So we're going to take that difference from 29 and 30. That difference is 1. We'll take half of it, which is 0 0.5, and we're going to add it to the upper limits and subtract it from the lower limits, and that will produce our boundaries. So let's do that. We'll have 25 minus 0 0.5, which is going to give you 24.5. And if I add it to the upper limit, it'll be 29.5. Okay, so there's my first class boundary. And I can do the same thing here. If I take away 0.5, I'll get 29.5. And it should match the one on the diagonal. Now you see what we've accomplished. We have now the end of the first category touching the beginning of the second category. And that's what we wanted. Okay, so we'll add that same 0.5 though to 34, we get 34.5. Okay, so to speed this up, I'm just going to do the rest of them very quickly. So this will become 39.5, this will become 44.5, this is going to be 49.5, then 54.5, then 59.5, and lastly 64.5. Alright, the thing to keep in mind here is that we don't need to fill in all the rest of these. We actually only require this little kind of reverse 7 here. So that pattern, like the first lower class boundary and then all the upper class boundaries. Those are the only ones we require for our drawing. See, these are all repeated, so we don't need to fill in all the rest of these guys. Just these are going to be good enough. Now, there's actually nine of these boundaries because there's the one lower class boundary and then the remaining eight upper class boundaries. So together, it's nine. Remember, we had eight categories. We'll always have one more boundary than the number of categories we had. That'll help us remember that you know when we have one more, we've got enough of them to do our drawing. All right, I'm just going to fill in the percents here real quick. The percents that were given to us in this table here are 8.82%. Then we have another 8.82%. And then we have 17.65, and then it looks like 11.76, um, and then 14.71, 8.82 again, and two 14.71s left after that. Okay, so those are the percentages that were given to us. So let's take these boundaries and these percents and go ahead and do our drawing now. Okay, so the first thing to do when you're doing your drawing is to draw a grid system. So you need an X and Y axis, basically. So I'm going to draw 
the y-axis or the vertical axis, and then I'll draw an x-axis, a horizontal axis. And that's going to give us space to put our boundaries at the bottom on the x-axis and put our percents on the vertical axis. So I'm going to label this axis the percents, and I'm going to label this axis the boundaries. But since the boundaries represent ages in this problem, I'm going to go ahead and write ages there so we remember what they're supposed to be. But remember, generically, they're the class boundaries. So I'll just go ahead and put boundaries next to it as well so that you don't forget that that's what goes there for other problems. All right, so there's your boundaries. Now, I had nine boundaries, so I'm going to put nine little marks, right? Evenly spaced because we had an even width for the table, right? So there's a four, that's five, six, seven, eight, nine. So there are my nine spaces that represent the boundaries. And I can actually fill in the boundaries, you know, it's 24.5, so 24.5, you know, 29.5. I didn't give myself a lot of room here, so I have to kind of squeeze it in. 34.5, and then finally 64.5. So those are my boundaries. I just place them all on the x-axis in that bottom row. Sometimes people will put like a little uh, almost like a cardiac symbol there. It's to say that, hey, look, you know, this is supposed to be zero, the origin. And so we obviously have chopped off some numbers to get all the way to 24.5 so quickly. So you can put that little mark there to indicate some of the number line has been removed to make the drawing look better. All right, and then lastly, what we're going to do is put the percents on this column. Now, if you look at our percent list, we have values that look like they range from a minimum of about 9% to a maximum of about 18%. So you want to, you know, label your axis accordingly. Don't raise all the, don't re label it all the way to 100%. We won't ever need to go that high. So, you know, since it's going to, you know, around 18 and, you know, down to a minimum of about 9, I'm just going to go ahead and label up to 20%, and I think I'll use 5% marks to do that. So I'm going to say, hey, this is 5, this is 10, this is 15, this is 20. So 5%, 10%, 15%, and 20%. So that's how I'll do the drawing like that. And then from there, the rest is pretty simple. We're just going to draw rectangles that correspond to these corresponding percent heights. So look, from 24.5 to 29.5, we're supposed to have a rectangle that's about 9% tall. So, you know, I'm just eyeballing it here, and it's just rough without a rule or whatever. There's a, a rectangle that I'm going to say is about 8.82%. And you can even write that at the top of it so people can tell how tall it is. Now the next rectangle actually starts at the same place the other one ended, so at 29.5 to 34.5. So we're going to actually take this and go here and then come over and go to there. And since it's the same height, I drew it at the same height, 8.82, right? So every rectangle will share a side with another rectangle. And then you repeat that process. The next one is about uh, 18 or so. so Again, I would come up to somewhere near 18, and there it is, right? And then so on and so forth, you just finish the table. So I'm just gonna do that quickly. Say this is about 11, so a little higher than 10. And then about 15, so maybe about here. And then again, 8.82, so about there. And then about 15 again for the last two. Okay, so there's my drawing. You know, I've left off the remaining labels, but that's basically it. So that's our histogram. There's sort of a bar chart that we've created using this table of data, and that's a pictorial representation of the information. And you'll notice that you know there's not a clear, distinct pattern. You know, it almost looks like a block in a way, without this aside from this little peak here. So basically, you know. You could look at this then and analyze certain assumptions you might have made about the distribution of stress strokes. You know, I might have thought, for example, there'd be more stress strokes as people got older. So I would might have expected small rectangles and then gradually taller and taller rectangles until it dropped off suddenly. But I don't see that pattern here, which means that my assumption about how strokes occur due to stress is probably wrong. I figured older people would have more strokes than younger people, but it doesn't seem to be that that's entirely true. So maybe perhaps um, my assumptions would have to be analyzed. Or perhaps, you know, you need another set of data and maybe the graph would look different. But either way, that's the results for this particular problem. All right, one last thing I want to mention. When you're looking at a graph like this, there's something called the left endpoint convention. And that convention simply states that 
when you look at this rectangle, since they do share a side, and you might ask, would you, you know, is 29.5 part of this rectangle or is it part of this rectangle? The left endpoint convention says that the left endpoint is part of the rectangle, but the right endpoint is not. So in other words, if there's a question mark of whether this number is part of this rectangle or this rectangle, 29.5 would be part of the second rectangle because it is the left endpoint of the second rectangle. So the left endpoint convention simply says that the number on the left of the rectangle is part of that rectangle. The number on the right of it is not necessarily part of it, it's probably part of the rectangle next to it. So again, if I asked, you know, what 49.5 is a part of, is 49.5 part of this rectangle or the rectangle here? Well, 49.5 is part of this shorter rectangle because it's the left endpoint of that rectangle, and we assume the left endpoint is part of the rectangle.